Good morning, and welcome to our service today at Lucan Presbyterian Church. Um, You're particularly welcome if you are a visitor, and I see one or two of those here today. And for those of you at home, you're also extremely welcome if you're joining us on the Facebook page. We hope that you're able to worship uh, fully with us today, and please leave comments um, and just to let us know that you're here with us. It's just great to know that it's not just those of us gathered here, 
but the much wider community uh, of our church uh, is, is tuning in today for the service. And of course, if you are going to be watching this um, later on today uh, on our YouTube uh, channel, then you're also very welcome. And we pray God's blessing on you. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Ian. I'm uh, one of the elders here. Um, and it's my privilege to lead you in worship today. Uh, as Richard was saying last week, he has uh, gone on sabbatical this summer. So he is not with us uh, through the July, well, late June, July, uh, August. He'll be back in September. So there'll be a number of different people leading and uh, a number of different people uh, coming to teach us from God's word. And today we're delighted that Billy, one of our members, has come all the way from a uh, sunny and beautiful Drew's Town House, as he always tells us, and he'll be sharing from God's word later in the service. And we're delighted that, that uh, he's here to do that. As we come to worship God, um, I just want to share something about my life. I am a teacher uh, through the week from, from Mondays to Fridays. And at the school I work in, um, we have a, a thing that we call the value of the month, where we explore a different value together uh, as a school community. And this month, uh, coming to the end of a, an unusual and demanding school year, uh, our value is gratitude, being grateful. Um, it, this is a, a simple uh, value to explore, but it's also a profound one, because it's something that we can often forget to be, to, to be, forget to be grateful, forget to give thanks uh, for what we have. Um, so we've been focusing in on that. Um, and as I was thinking about today's service, I thought, we as the people of God, um, we have so much to be thankful for, so much to be grateful for, for, for who God is and for what he has done for us um, and continues to do so as we begin the service today, I want to read from the Psalms, Psalm 145, one of the great uh, Psalms of praise written by uh, King David. Um, and I'm going to read this from the, the uh, message, the, the, the translation uh, from the message. Um, so here we go, Psalm 145. I lift your high in praise, my God, O my King. And I'll bless your name into eternity. I'll bless you every day and keep it up from now to eternity. God is magnificent. He can never be praised and thanked enough. There are no boundaries to his greatness. Generation after generation stands in awe of your work. Each one tells stories of your mighty acts. Your beauty and splendor have everyone talking. I compose songs on your wonders. Your marvelous doings are headline news. I could write a book full of the details of your greatness, O Lord. The fame of your goodness spreads across the country. Your righteousness is on everyone's lips. God is all mercy and grace, not quick to anger. He is rich in love. God is good to one and all. Everything he does is suffused with grace. Creation and creatures applaud you, God. Your holy people bless you. They talk about the glories of your rule. They exclaim over your splendor, letting the world know of your power for good, the lavish splendor of your kingdom. And your kingdom is a kingdom eternal. You will never be voted out of office. God always does what he says and is gracious in everything he does. God gives a hand to those down on their luck, gives a fresh start to those who are ready to quit. All eyes are on you, expectant. You give us our meals on time. Generous to a fault, you lavish your favor on all your creatures. Everything God does is right. The trademark on all his works is love. God's there, listening for all who pray, for all who pray and mean it. He does what's best for those who fear him, hears them call out and saves them. God sticks by all who love him. My mouth is filled with God's praise. Let everything living bless him and praise him. Bless his holy name 
now and forever. In that attitude of praise, I'm going to invite you, those of you who are here, to stand and we're going to sing together the hymn, Come People of the Risen King. It has a wonderful refrain where we're asked to rejoice and rejoice because of what God has done for us and who he is. And those of you at home, please feel free to sing your hearts out. We can only sing quietly here, but you can really go for it at home. So let's sing this song together. Please stand. lead you in prayer. Lord God, creator, sustainer, risen king, here in your presence we want to rejoice and give thanks to you for who you are and for all you have and continue to do for us. We can't count all the blessings you have lavished on us, Lord. They are too many to count and to number. Lord, we praise you that you are enthroned in heaven and that your kingdom reaches out and through all of creation. We thank you for your never-failing goodness to us, your constant love and kindness. And even though we do not deserve it, 
and still choose to go our own way, Lord, and live for ourselves much more often than we would live for you or others. We thank you that through Jesus, our Savior, you forgive us our sins and pour out mercy and grace into our lives. Lord Jesus, we praise you that you have lived, died, and risen again to redeem us and make us your own, a people belonging to you. Lord, we rejoice today in your promises, fulfilled and to be fulfilled, and for the hope of everlasting life. So Lord, today, as the people of the risen King, we adore you and praise you. May our mouths speak out and our lives reveal your love, your glory and your power. Forever and ever we pray these things in your name. Amen. For those of you who are our younger members and those of you who are not so young, we're going to have a story now uh, taken from the Jesus Storybook Bible and read to us uh, by one of our members, Inga. So sit back and be blessed by this story. And after that, we'll stand here and you at home can join in a, a song of praise. A little girl and a poor fray lady. The story of Jairus's daughter from Luke 8. There was once a little girl who didn't get out of bed one morning or the next or the next. In fact, she didn't get out of bed for a whole month. She was very sick and no one knew how to make her better. Jairus was a daddy and he loved her. One day he was sitting by her bed holding her hand, wishing there was something he could. I know, he said. He jumped to his feet, put on his coat, kissed his daughter, ran down the steps, 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 past the servants, out of the house, through the gates, along the road, into the town, up the steps, 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 and into the temple. He fought his way through all the people until at last he found who he was looking for. Jesus, he said, falling at Jesus' feet. My daughter, he pleaded, please. But he didn't need to beg, because before he'd even finished speaking, Jesus reached out his hand and helped him up. I'll come at once, Jesus said. Jairus' eyes filled with tears. Jesus was coming. It would be all right. In those days, of course, they didn't have any ambulances, so they had to go by foot. Jesus' helpers knew that he would heal the sick girl, but they must hurry. If Jesus didn't get there soon, it would be too late. Jesus walked into the little girl's bedroom, and there, lying in the shadows, was the still little figure. Jesus sat on the bed and took her pale hand. Honey, he said, it's time to get up. And he reached down into death and gently pulled the little girl back to life. The little girl woke up, rubbed her eyes, as if she had just had a good night's sleep and leapt out of bed. Jesus threw open the shutters and sunlight flooded the dark room. Hungry? Jesus asked. She nodded. Jesus called to her family, bring this little girl some breakfast. Jesus helped and healed many people like this. He made blind people see, he made deaf people hear, he made lame people walk. Jesus was making the sad things come untrue. He was mending God's broken world.
Now, I loved that story, the story of Jairus' daughter. Um, and I loved that last line that Inga read from the storybook Bible about Jesus was go- mending God's broken world, or God was using Jesus to mend our broken world. And that's a perfect lead into our prayers for others. And Frank is going to come and lead us in those now. Jesus said, come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. In Job it is written, man is born to trouble. Surely as sparks fly upwards from a fire. Whatever you are facing, Jesus is calling and is not far from you. He is alongside of you. The example of two cows plowing the field together, a wooden harness connected them together. The older experienced cow knew how it was done and was stronger. Jesus calls out to you, take my harness upon you and learn from me, for I am the one to follow. I am gentle and lowly. I will take the weight. You will find rest for your soul. There are many ways in the world that seem to be the way to go, enticing and alluring, offering promises of satisfaction at the beginning, and the world beckons you. Come. You're told you know what is best for you. Walk this way. But it will become your master. Deep, deep down in your soul, a low, soft voice of conscience is calling to you. There is a true path. Jesus says, follow me, watch me, learn my ways in how to see correctly and do what is best. It is written. Our God has tasted our earth-bound life. He knew before, but still he went the road that was laid out to him. He came to lay down his life for you, to fully pay for your self-centered, empty ways. Come to me. I have already carried your burden. Learn the true living in my words. My spirit will counsel you. I will show you true love and how to love. Sway us to the rhythm of your movement. Holy Spirit, help us to breathe in. Lead us daily by your spirit to live your right way. Give us the hunger for you, longing to be in your presence. Give us wisdom to know that the world, what the world offers leads us away from you. It's so easily feeds the wrong in us, keep us from them, help us to turn around and run away to you. Pure life is seek God, to seek first your kingdom and your righteousness, real joy in the joining, true living, keeping us in step with the Holy Spirit. The world's way will make us slaves. Jesus, you are the truth, the way, the life. The world values are not yours. No one is beyond your love. Help us to show the love. Jesus' last command to tell the world about him, make disciples. I pray for the nations who have come to Ireland. I pray for Muslim men and women and children that they may be given a clear presentation of the gospel and come to know the true God. I also pray for other churches that teach that Jesus is not the only way to the Father. May they change to what you have written. You call us to yourself we are chosen by you. Please draw our children, parents, relations, friends to you. Lead us by your spirit to say the right words and right actions so we are partners with you in spreading the, the best news. Soften their hearts. May the seeds be planted and grow. Finally, thy will be done. Let us be in your ways daily, forgiving others as you have forgiven us. In the name of the Father, Son, and Spirit, Holy unity, thy will be done. Lead us on. Amen. Before Billy comes to speak, I'm going to read from John's Gospel. It's chapter 6, if you'd like to follow in your Bibles. Chapter 6, verses 25 to 59, and it's entitled, uh, Jesus, the Bread of Life. So John chapter 6, verses 25 to 59. When they found him on the other side of the lake, 
they asked him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus answered, I tell you the truth. You were looking for me, not because you saw miraculous signs, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. On him God the Father has placed his seal of approval. Then he asked him, then they asked him, what must we do to do the works God requires? Jesus answered, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. So they asked him, what miraculous signs then will you give that we may see it and believe you? What will you do? Our forefathers ate the manna in the desert, as it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, from now on, give us this bread. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry, but he who believes in me will never be thirsty. But as I told you, you have seen me and still you do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never drive away. For I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And this is the will who, of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of all that he has given me, but raise them up at the last day. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. At this the Jews began to grumble about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They said, is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he now say, I came down from heaven? Stop grumbling among yourselves, Jesus answered. No one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. It is written in the prophets, they will all be taught by God. Everyone who listens to the Father and learns from him comes to me. No one has seen the Father except the one who is from God. Only he has seen the Father. I tell you the truth. He who believes has everlasting life. I am the bread of life. Your forefathers ate the manna in the desert, yet they died. But here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which a man may eat and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Then the Jews began to argue sharply among themselves. How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth. Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is real food, and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in him. Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your forefathers ate manna and died, but he who feeds on this bread will live forever. He said this while teaching in the synagogue in Capernaum. Amen. Okay. Well, good morning, everyone, and uh, good morning at home uh, to everyone listening there. Uh, what a joy to be back uh, in the building this morning. Uh, I, I think the last time I had the privilege of uh, sharing the Word of God with you, uh, it was uh, about a year ago. There was heavy restrictions. Uh, it was a recorded message um, and uh, very impersonal in many ways. And yet here we are back in the building again, back uh, on the past, uh, getting back to normal. And yet, even if all the restrictions were lifted, you know, um, we would still be restricted. We would be restricted in comparison uh, to the worship that we will enjoy 
when we worship him around his throne. Uh, what a day, what a glorious day that will be. Now, I'd like to bring you a, uh, a word of encouragement and challenge this morning from perhaps um, some of the most important uh, hours in Jesus' ministry, certainly the most important 24-hour period in his ministry, and it informs us how to live an accomplished life. But before we turn to the Word of God, just a, a quick update, a brief update on the work that we're involved in. Dublin Family Outreach or Life Studies have ceased for this summer. We actually have a barbecue this afternoon. Um, and at that barbecue, uh, we're going to be discussing the possibility from September of meeting each week uh, to worship God. Um, it'll be a big step, a big commitment for everyone involved. And yet uh, this is the vision that we have had uh, to see a group of God's people come together in their own community to worship the true and living God. I'd value your prayers for Drew's Town House uh, and the uh, camps that are going to be happening down at Drew's Town House, as Ian says, where it is always beautiful. And uh, you're all invited to come down and enjoy the beauty and the serenity down there. Um, camps will be limited in number, uh, and that means that we will run the camps with virtually no volunteers. Uh, none of us are getting any younger. It's not getting any easier to run camp. And uh, so I'd, I'd value your prayers for that down at Drew's Town. I'd value your prayer as well as we consider merging with Drew's Town House uh, and another organisation from the north, the church planting organisation, uh, called Transformation Centre. Uh, we certainly value your prayers as we um, decide on that and ask for God's leading and guidance. Thank you to everybody who supports that ministry in prayer and financially. Aren't you just sick of it? Sick, sore and tired of it. I know I am. Sick, sore and tired of restrictions and COVID-19 and uh, variants and mutations we're on the Delta variant. Who knows what's going to happen when we get to Epsilon and then Zeta, Theta, Eta, and all the way down the Greek alphabet? Will our vaccines be able to cope? Will they protect us from these new variants? What will happen then? Human life is so precarious, isn't it? All that it took really was one virus causing germ. And you can't even see the thing unless you look down the lens of a microscope. That's all it took to bring the human race to your knees. And yet, corporately, as the human race, in the life of the human race, we've, we've accomplished and achieved so much. And you can think of all the accomplishments of the human race over the years. Uh, but just a couple of weeks ago, I was impressed that NASA has announced that they're going to launch... Um, two missions to the planet Venus, and they flew a drone on the planet Mars, all the way from Earth. What an achievement. And you can now book a seat on a flight. I'm not quite sure how COVID restricts this one, but you can book a seat on a flight to go 100 kilometers straight up into space and view the blue planet from an angle that you've never seen before. That's if you have $150 million to spare. Now, there's something for the bucket list, isn't it? Now, I, I, I don't mean the $150 million. Uh, for 15 minutes, that's like $10 million a minute. I, I meant the, uh, to boldly go where no one has gone before, up into space. In the life of our nation, you know, we've accomplished so much. Just consider how the Irish have contributed to the world of uh, literature and arts and film, science and medicine and technology, or the sporting achievements of this small but mighty nation. As the human race, in the corporate life of the human race, we've achieved a lot. In the life of our nation, we've achieved a lot. And I heard a, a, a different uh, take on the, a different perspective on the, uh, the virus uh, recently, on the pandemic. Uh, it was a radio show. And the, um, the broadcaster was saying how he, at last he'd been able to meet up socially with a few friends and enjoy their company. And uh, everyone in the group was sharing, uh, well, this is what I achieved in my life during the pandemic. One guy had learned French 
and a few words of Spanish. Another uh, person had uh, learned to, to read sheet piano and now could, of uh, uh, sheet music, and now could play the piano, uh, and so on and so forth around the group until it got to the, uh, the broadcaster. And he shared that all he achieved in his life during the pandemic uh, was to keep doing his radio program. Uh, he felt he had wasted his pandemic uh, by only just doing what he always just did. Anyway, I wonder, how did you use your pandemic? What did you achieve in your life in that strange period of life? You see, in our corporate life, uh, as the human race, in the life of our nation, in your personal life, you know, we've come far and we've achieved a lot. And in the middle of all that living and achieving, in the middle of all that life, Jesus says, I am the bread of life. In that culture in which Jesus lived, bread was the basic essential sustenance of life. No matter how far you want to look down the lens of a microscope or travel up into space or achieve in your life during a pandemic, if you truly want to know life, a fulfilled life, life in all its fullness, then you need to know Jesus, the basic essential sustenance of life. Now, Jesus makes that statement, as Ian read. It was, he was speaking to a crowd in Capernaum, and the crowd was surprised that he was there because when they saw him just the day before, he was on the other side of the lake. The disciples were getting into the boat to set sail to Capernaum, and Jesus was still on shore, dismissing the crowd. Rabbi, how did you get here? They asked him. This is one of the most important 24-hour periods in the ministry of Jesus. A 24-hour period. Now, if, if we were watching this story as a series on Netflix, right now on screen, there'd be a screenshot which would say, and I really hear it when they do it, 24 hours before. And then it winds back to the, the day before. Well, that's what we need to do because to understand the context of this story and this I am saying of Jesus, you need to consider that just hours before Jesus walked on water, which is just hours after Jesus feeds 5,000 men with five loaves and two fish. And, and that's just after Jesus hears that his cousin John has been brutally murdered. And that's just... That's just after Jesus, well, just before his disciples returned to him because he had given them authority and sent them out with authority to cure diseases, restore those disabled and cast out demons. You see, all of those events in that 24-hour period are in the context of his life, his authority and his teaching. The lives of his disciples are changed dramatically because they were doing life with Jesus. They came to experience what it was to live in Jesus' name, to bring freedom from disease, from disability, and from demons. The life course of those disciples has been radically altered because of the life, the authority, and the teaching of Jesus. They've come to a turning point in their lives. And it's why this is such an important 24-hour period in the ministry of Jesus. Jesus had given them authority, had sent them out. Now, can you imagine how excited those disciples were as they come back after going out themselves? No longer were they watching Jesus do it. No longer did they see him cast out a demon or raise a little girl to life. Now they are doing it. Yes, in the power and the authority of Jesus, but it's they who are doing it. Their lives are radically changed. Can you imagine their euphoria as they come back now, as they regroup around Jesus and, and as, as they get to see each other, oh, this is what happened here. And, and to, do you know what this is? Uh, can you imagine how excited they are as they come back to Jesus? and share all that they have achieved in their lives. Meanwhile, the tide had continued to turn in these 24 hours. Jesus has some life-changing news as well. He has heard that John called the Baptist his cousin, 
has been beheaded. Now, if a member of your family was beheaded, executed by the authorities, you would be, you would be emotionally and spiritually impacted. Your life would be shattered. And it's happened now to Jesus. He's just heard what has happened to John. But not only is this his relative, this is also the God-appointed forerunner of Messiah, the voice of one crying in the wilderness. This is a turning point in the ministry of Jesus because now he who came to prepare the way is gone, his ministry accomplished and finished. Jesus tells his uh, jubilant and euphoric and I'm sure tired disciples, Come aside with me and rest a while. They need it rest, and he need it rest. But as they go to that deserted place, to find the rest, instead they find a crowd. And he has compassion on the crowd and he teaches them. And yet feeding five thousand men with five loaves and two fish, it isn't just about hungry bellies. This miracle is the only miracle, I don't know if you know this, it's the only miracle recorded in all four Gospels, and that adds an importance to it. John records that Jesus asked Philip, where can we buy bread to feed all of these people? But Jesus only asked that in order to test them because Jesus had in mind what he was going to do. He's teaching his disciples that they can depend on him, even in impossible-looking circumstances of life. I wonder, do you consider that you've been facing some impossible-looking circumstances in your life? The crowd wanted to make him king by force, not in the sense of forcing Jesus to become the king. 5,000 men is an army. Enough men to form a Roman legion, a good-sized Roman legion, They were going to force their way down to Jerusalem. They were going to fight those Roman soldiers. They were going to fight their way past the temple guard. They were going to stand by the pillar in the temple and declare, long live the king, to reestablish the kingdom of Israel. But Jesus knows that that wasn't to be the way in which the promises of God would be fulfilled. Jesus would indicate that plan the next day. But meantime, at the last watch of the night, he notices that his disciples in the boat are straining at the oars for there was a strong wind blowing against them. Once again, he uses the opportunity to teach them about his power and authority. We're still in that context of his life, his authority and his teaching. He goes out to them walking on the water. Even the physical laws of the universe are subject to his command and his authority. They can depend on him in the impossible look and circumstances of life. The boat arrives safely on the other side of the lake, the Capernaum side of the lake, and the people gather. And they're amazed when they see Jesus there. Verse 25, Rabbi, when did you get here? There's the context and there's the background of these words that Jesus utters. But he ignores the when did you get here question. And he gets to the issue in the hearts of the people who were asking the question. Verse 27 in John 6, Jesus tells them, Don't work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. I wonder what is our priority when we come to Jesus in prayer? Is it spiritual transformation in our life? Or is it always just a shopping list of physical needs? With an eye in the physical realm, the crowd's response is to inquire of Jesus after God's requirements. What must we do to do the works that God requires? But the work, as Jesus puts it in verse 29, is to believe in him, the one whom God has sent. In other words, there were no works of righteousness. There were no good deeds that could be performed by them in order for them to earn eternal life. Eternal life can only be achieved by faith in the Son of Man. Jesus points their view 
back into the spiritual realm. And that's how he continues. They keep coming back with the physical. He keeps countering with the spiritual. In verse 30, the people ask for a sign. The example that they refer to is the manna in the desert, the bread that God provides for them in the wilderness. They're still focusing on physical sustenance that Jesus, just the day before, had demonstrated that he could provide. Maybe they were hoping that Jesus would do a miracle, uh, repeat the miracle, and provide enough bread for yet another day. Once again, Jesus goes to the spiritual reality. The bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Always give us that bread, the crowd reply. Still wanting the physical. I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Jesus knows that many in the crowd, they're just not getting this spiritual depth that's in his words. They've seen him, but they still don't believe. Jesus mentions coming down from heaven. And again, the crowd revert to the physical. Is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph? whose father and mother we know? How can he say he came down from heaven? When Jesus mentions that the bread of life is his flesh and that they need to eat his flesh and drink his blood, well, that is, you know, that's just a step too far. By, by verse 66, John 6, 66, the old 666, remember that one. In John 6, 66, this was a decision that they made. It was too hard too hard a saying. that We just can't follow this guy. And it says, many of his disciples turned back. Many of his disciples, not his enemies, many of his disciples turned and no longer followed him. This crucial 24-hour period is a turning point for everyone. Jesus turns to his 12 and he says, you do not want to leave me too, do you? And it's like the, the crescendo of this 24 hours of teaching comes from the lips of Peter. Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Like ourselves, the disciples may not have understood everything about God. They may not have understood everything about Jesus, his life, his authority, his teaching. But they'd seen enough, they'd heard enough, they experienced enough to know that we can only come to God, God's way. We can't get there our own way. And once we come to eternal life in the name of Jesus, we can only be sustained in that life by the basic sustenance of life, the bread of heaven. Bread was central, you know, in the, the Jewish uh, way of life. It was made daily and consumed daily. It was central to Sabbath worship, central to worship in the temple. Um, it was part of the great feasts of the Jewish calendar. As on leavened bread, it was an integral part of the Passover. And as manna, it was ingrained in the history of the nation of how God sustained the nation for 40 years in the desert. Life without bread would be unthinkable for these people. Bread was the basic essential sustenance of life. Now, I've noticed over the years that we have some very special young people in our congregation, young people to be proud of. And it's incredible to consider what they will achieve in the impossible-looking circumstances of today's world as they live by his life, his authority, and his teaching. In the words of William Carey, a missionary who's famed as the uh, father of modern mission, he's quoted as saying, great, expect great things from God, attempt great things for God. And our young people, more than any other generation that has gone before, live in a world of impossible looking circumstances. I'm glad I'm not a young person trying to live as a Christian nowadays. It's even harder than it ever was before. But you know, young people, your God is the God who will empower you to overcome those impossible looking circumstances and change the world in which you live. And for all of us, no matter what stage of life we're at or where we are in the pathway of life, there are still great things to attempt for God. 
but we can only hope to achieve them as we come to him who is the bread of life, the basic essential sustenance of our souls. And there you have it. 24 hours that was the turning point in the ministry of Jesus and in the lives of his disciples and those who no longer followed him. Amen. May it be your blessing today to know him who is the basic, essential sustenance of life. Now, as our closing hymn of Chosen, Be Thou My Vision. And uh, firstly, it's because it's one of my favourites. It's a hymn uh, that I would like folks to sing, sing at my funeral. Uh, as you place me down into my, uh, my, I would like to call it my place of resurrection, uh, and not my grave, my place of resurrection. And then secondly, um, I want to sing it because of that first line, be thou my vision, O Lord, of my life. Um, may, may Jesus be all that you see. May he be your vision. And may he be all that is seen in your life. Be thou my vision, O Lord of my life. Let us sing, let us live. Be thou my vision. Amen.
webpage, or and there's also a telephone number there that you can do that through. Uh, there are spaces left for the coming weeks, so please uh, check online to see if there are spaces available, and then you can book on. And you can book on right through the summer. You don't have to just wait for a week per week. Uh, you can book right uh, through to the end of August. If you require the services of a minister, it, it's not Richard, as we've said. Um, the Reverend Alan Ball from Abbey Presbyterian uh, is uh, available for, for any pastoral uh, needs or issues uh, for the coming weeks. Um, and if you're not sure how to contact him, then you can contact myself or one of the other elders. Uh, again, our numbers are on the website for, for the church. Um, so please do get in touch if you need anything or any support in any way. We're going to finish uh, by saying the benediction together. It's going to go on the screen in just a moment. Um, I'll invite everyone here to stand and we'll say it together. And uh, you at home, please join with us as well. So we say together, Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship and friendship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Amen. And just to say to those of you who are here, uh, please stay and uh, spend some time chatting with each other, getting to know each other, reacquainting ourselves with each other. The sun did come out, and hopefully it will come out again. So we always encourage you, if possible, to go outside and chat, um, and it would be great just to, to, to spend some time together. And you at home... We ask God's blessing on you for the week to come and hopefully see some of you here in future weeks. Thank you.